Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. We're going to talk today about why not to have basal dependencies. Uh, my name is Greg Mogolin. I am co-founder of Aspect.dev, and we are a basal-focused consulting company. We work with small to large companies to help them plan, execute basal migrations. I am also a co-maintainer of rules, Node.js. So for anyone using it, um, talk to me after. <laughs> my name is Alex. Uh, I work at Google. I'm also working on rules, Node.js with Greg. Um, and uh, so before we can talk about dependencies, we have to talk about how you release rule sets. So to give a little bit of context, as authors of rules Node.js, we're pretty familiar with how to write a rule set for Bazel. I know you're probably not all rule set maintainers, but even if you're users, I hope this is interesting for you. So how does a rule set um, publish itself for you to use it? So this very simple way, which Florian talked about earlier in the talk about the federation, um, is that you simply have an HTTP archive or a Git repository rule that a user fetches um, and it just gets a commit or a tag, something from the, re from the archive, and you end up with getting the whole source tree every time. Um, whatever transitive dependencies are in that project, you get them. There's no semantic versioning there, so it's kind of hard to understand whether the version is even greater or less than something else that you see, or whether it's safe to upgrade. Um, the, 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 the checksum can be unstable, like if GitHub changes their front ends, which they did once, then all the checksums change. Um, and so like, we think this is kind of hard for users to use. Even if, uh, even if you're okay with using them this way, um, Florian mentioned that the federation is going to require that you instead um, start using Semver. And so what we propose here is that uh, it's better to have a release archive, so some sort of packaging rule like, like Florian talked about. You have a smaller download size because you're not fetching tests and, and documentation and um, things like that. You get the stable SHA-256. Uh, which is handy because it means that part of our release process can actually give you the new um, snippet that goes in your workspace file, including the checksum, because we know it before we publish it. Um, and we can use Semver, which is nice. Um, semantic versioning means that users can rely on, like, they can have a keep on, stay on the stable release. You can publish RCs and betas. Basically, you can put information in the version number that's useful. Um, and we like to put release notes there, too, and mention the breaking changes. So the reason we're talking about this in the dependency talk is simply that that's a prerequisite for what we want to get to. So the problem we really wanted to talk about is this dependency problem. And it's the basic motivating thing that the Federation is talking about. And you can go back and watch Florian's talk, where he did a great job explaining the problem. I can add a little bit of color there. Um, in Google internal, we don't have this problem. Um, we do have a workspace file, uh, which most Googlers maybe have never seen. It only contains um, toolchain config rules. And it's like eight of them. And that's the entire thing for all of Google engineers. That's the workspace file. So your workspace files are much more complicated and you have these problems and it's basically a less mature solution because we haven't been using it ourselves. Um, Googlers are also sort of biased that because we can depend on everything and we're, we're, we're sure that all the tool chains are wired up correctly, we do. And so we build lots of things from source. We have remote execution, remote caching, it works fine. Um, but our, our model when we approach rule sets would be, oh, well, sure, just make dependencies on all the languages that you might need. Um, and those transitive dependencies are, of course, a burden on you, the users, your workspace file is complicated. Um, there's no way, uh, if, even if we had a better way to write the workspace file, we're missing a lot of information, which is that we don't know what range of a certain dependency is supported. So Florian talked about rules go depending on, on Bazel Skylib, for example. Rules go probably works with a range of Skylib versions, but you only know one of them, which is the one that it currently says it depends on, which makes it harder for you to do the, uh, the computation to resolve what, what version you can use. Um, and so the Federation, we're looking forward to the Federation. I'm, I love that the Bazel team is attacking this problem. There's a lot of limitations. As Florian said, they're really just trying to find like, a small thing that they can do in the current semantics that makes things better. Um, but users still run into dependency hell. Either you're using a rule set that's not part of the Federation, you decide not to use the Federation, or the other problem is that rule sets with complicated dependencies will make it hard for the Federation to find a single version of all the stuff that works together. And so the problem may move from you as users to the Federation, but it's still going to be impossible for them to cut a release if the dependency graph just can't be resolved down to a single version. So uh, we have a few insights that we think are useful. The main one is the development versus runtime dependencies. This is not really a concept that, that Maisel has built in. Uh, other, other ecosystems do. and so. The idea is that not all users actually wanted to build everything from source, and so if you ship binaries, then you don't need the, the dependency that you have to, to show up for users. And so, for example, we use Go in some of the stuff that in rules Node.js, but JavaScript developers do not want to download the Go SDK. It's 120 megs, so we ship little five megabyte binaries for each of the three supported platforms. Um, this means that users don't have to download that stuff. 
Um, we also do other tricks. So in our build files, we have a, a range, like a begin and end internal um, fence as comments. And then we cut those out when we publish the archive. That allows us to cut depths like Bazel, like uh, Stardock. So we generate um, documentation for APIs. We don't want users to have load statements show up in the files that they fetch that require Stardock, because then users need to fetch, I don't know, Java and Python and like everything else. Very quickly, use spaghetti out to get all of the dependencies. Um, so very quickly, if you're a rule author and you introduce a transitive depth, you know this happens because your integration test, you had to update a workspace file. That's a red flag. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Um, or you have to update your readme. Maybe you shouldn't do that. So we'd, like, basically try not to take dependencies if you can avoid it. Um, also, there's a problem that you, it's easy to accidentally take a dependency on something that's less stable than your package. And then that just doesn't work because users end up needing the unstable bits to run your stable thing. Um, there's a separate approach. Uh, I, I should have pointed out that that fencing obviously requires that you, you run a packaging tool. You can't just, just have users download your sources. Um, so another approach is you can have a third party directory. Um, Bazel itself does this for some things. So one example would be if you just need some functions from Skylib, don't have a dependency on Skylib that uses, shows up for users, just copy the functions in that you need and put them and properly vendor them into your repo with licensing. Um, protocol buffers, like the worker protocol is a good example for this. Obviously, you can't do this all the time. It's pretty limited. Providers have to come as symbols from the repository that it says. So if you make a copy of a Skylib file with a provider, it's not going to work. Um, and the case study, so we, I work in rules closure, and a bunch of people from TensorFlow happen to depend on it just because there's a load statement in there. Probably shouldn't have been. It breaks our ability to make breaking changes. Um, and so I have an issue open for that. And I'll let Greg talk about some more case studies. Thanks, Alex. So I'm just going to, that's an example of a issue on TensorFlow. I will quickly run you through what we do at Rosenode.js about everything Alex talks about right there. Um, we want to ship fewer transitive deaths to our users, and we want to make it easier for them to manage the depths that we do have. This is our workspace. We have lots of depths, which is fine. Um, I'll just point out one of them. There's the rules go depth, which we use to build the dev server in Go, so it's performant. We actually share that code with G3. Google 3, and we don't want to pass that to our users because our users said they don't want to build a Go program. They just want to build a binary. So when we started releasing artifacts, we actually put the output Go binaries into our artifacts so users can just use the binaries instead of depending on rules Go. Um, we also put the guards in, as Alex mentioned, and this is an example of what that looks like, which a packaging tool would take out that load statement. You wouldn't see that in the release artifact. So we actually do release multiple release artifacts, I should mention. We, over, we hijacked NPM, we published some of our rules via NPM. So if you want to get TS Library, you would actually download the Bazel TypeScript NPM package. And um, this means that users can use the package manager that they already know, namely NPM and Yarn, to get the rules that they want. So the result of this is this is what a user would see in their workspace. This is from our repository. And there's not a lot of depths. Rules Node.js has no transitive depths. There's a yarn install right there, which is a repository rule. Um, the rules that come from NPM are, there's a step there to install those. And in this case, Bazel Protractor, which is a Protractor rule, actually depends on rules web testing. And there's some initialization steps there. So you can't get rid of every transitive depth, um, but you can make it better for your users. This is an example package JSON file. There's four packages there of rules that we publish. And there's also a couple of rules that come in automatically because we auto-generate uh, rules based on bin, uh, the bin attribute and the package JSONs for some packages. So if you get the Mocha package, you automatically get a Mocha test rule uh, without any extra effort. So it's a bit strange to override your package manager, but we found that NPM is already great at fetching dependencies and handling transitive depths. And so we utilize this for the Bazel rules. Um, and it also means that because we have many guarantee that transitive depths don't leak. So for example, if a user is using the TypeScript rule, it's pretty easy to be sure that they're not going to depend on rules web testing if they don't need the Karma rule. It also means we have smaller release artifacts because there's, there's more of those. And for us, it means that we only need to maintain a small set of rules for the key packages that really need special cases, such as roll up and terser, and the community can actually contribute rules just via NPM without actually overriding or without pull requesting as a repository. OK, so to quickly wrap things up, um, I think as rule authors, we should think about making rules easy to consume and to use, which means think about which transitive depths you're going to push onto your users 
and don't push more than necessary. And we want to, um, if possible, provide users with Semba releases with change logs, and that makes it possible to reduce the transit of depths as well in that case. As users, you should know that not all rule sets do have release artifacts at this point, um, and don't be afraid to make contributions or issues to rule sets if you have issues with transit of depths. And moving forward, I think, well, we think the ecosystem's maturing, different rule sets are in different levels of maturity. Uh, as last mentioned, the Federation's a great step in the right direction to make it easier for users to manage their transitive depths and to clean up their workspace file, but there's probably lots of room for improvement, and uh, hopefully we'll all converge on best practices of rule authors. So thank you very much, and that's everything. Totally covered. You did. You did. I nailed it. Covered a lot of ground. Um, feel free to talk.